Chapter 37 It was a trip of only perhaps fifteen minutes as the Quam Quay flew to the far side of the Hand of Thrawn and the Lake, of, uh, the lake Child of Winds had mentioned. At first Luke had been skeptical of the whole idea, concerned about the young alien's ability to handle the weight of their passengers, not to mention whether or not they would be able to keep out of sight in targeting range of what were surely by now a seriously hostile group of enemies in the fortress. But the Quam Quay had surprised him on both counts, and as they weaved expertly in and out of the cover of trees and rocks and mountain gullies, he almost began to relax about this phase of the operation. Mera, too, he could sense, had already turned her thoughts ahead to what they would find at the far end of the short flight. The same, unfortunately, could not be said of R2. Suspended in the center of the framework they'd rigged out of their last lengths of synth rope, he moaned and gurgled the whole way. The cut in the rock was no more than ten meters from the edge of the lake, descending at a fairly steep angle from under a partial overhang of grass-clumped soil. At least the rock isn't too rough, Mara commented, running a hand experimentally along the lower surface. Probably worn down by years of little fire-creeper feet running over it. R2 seemed to shudder, warbling uncomfortably. I doubt we'll run into any more of them this time around, Luke soothed him as he untangled the synth rope and tucked it back into the droid storage compartment. Swarms that size can't travel too close together. There won't be enough food for them all. Let's just hope they're smart enough to know that, Mara added. You are fortunate to have come when you did, Child of Wind said. There has been much rain in the past few seasons, and the lake of small fish has been growing ever larger. And have the small fish been getting bigger, too? Mara asked. The child of winds fluttered his wings. I do not know. Is it important? Mara shook her head. It was a joke. Skip it. Oh. Child of winds looked back at Luke. I simply meant that soon this entrance may be covered over with water. I understand, Luke said. But for the moment it's not, and you got us here safely. It was to our great honor, Child of Wind said. What do you wish us to do now? You've done more than enough already, Luke assured him. Thank you. Thank you all. Shall we wait for you? The Quam Quay persisted. We would be honored to wait and take you again to your flying machine. Luke hesitated. A ride back to the ship could be very useful indeed. Unfortunately... The problem is that I have no idea where we'll be coming out, he said. Then we will watch, Child of Wind said firmly, and others will watch also. Yes, all right, Luke agreed, anxious to cut off the discussion and get on their way. Thank you. So what's our marching order, Mara asked. I'll go first, Luke said, sitting down on the edge of the slope and putting his legs into the opening. Our two next, you last. I'll watch for bottlenecks and try to widen them as I pass. If I miss one, you'll have to deal with it. Right, Mara said, pulling her lightsaber from her belt. Happy landings, and try not to get, uh, try not to cut off your own feet along the way. Thanks. Igniting his lightsaber, holding the blade ready over his outstretched legs, Luke eased onto the slope and started down. It wasn't nearly as bad as he'd feared. Years of little fire creeper feet might indeed have smoothed down the rock. More importantly, they'd also worn away most of whatever obstructions might once have existed there. Only twice did he have to slice out pieces of rock as he slid his bouncy way down, and in one of those cases it probably hadn't really been necessary. Behind him, he could hear the much louder metallic clattering as R2 slid down the slope, almost but not quite covering up his continual unhappy twittering. The slope emptied into one of the same sort of tunnels they'd spent far too much time in over the past couple of weeks. Luke caught R2 as he fell out, getting him out of the way in time to give Mera a clear landing spot. Well, here we are again, she said, playing her glow rod around. Doesn't look particularly familiar. Any guesses as to which way? From the position of the fortress, I'd say that way, Luke said, pointing to the left. Okay, Mara said. Let's go. The Quam Quay, whether by design or simple luck, had chosen their entrance well. 
They had gone no more than a hundred meters along the tunnel when Luke rounded a curve to see an all-too-familiar natural stone archway in the near distance. We're here, he murmured back towards Mara. Be ready. If they know about the stairway, they'll probably have guards waiting for us inside. There were no guards. Fifteen minutes later, having struggled through the narrow gap in the cortosis-laden rock, they were once again standing in the underground room. I guess they don't know about the stairway after all, Mara commented, playing her glow rod across the cut they'd made earlier in the yellow inner wall. Or else they don't have a way of getting into it, Luke reminded her. Even the locking mechanism on these doors seemed to be made of hajarna stone. Don't misunderstand. I'm just as happy to give them miss this time through, Mara hastened to say. I wonder how many of those power conduits are running at the moment. Probably more than the last time we went through, Luke said, turning his glow rod to point the other way. As before, the far end of the room was lost in the shadows beyond the light. I wonder how long this room is. It can't be too long, Mara pointed out. There's a lake somewhere that direction, remember? Right, Luke agreed. Got any sage advice before we start? Just that we be careful, Mara said, joining him. Side by side as long as we can with the droid behind us, lightsabers and senses ready. Succinct and practical, Luke said, stretching out ahead of them with the force. There was no danger yet that he could sense. Come on, R2. Mara's point about the room's size turned out to be correct. They had gone only a few steps when the back wall came within range of their glow rods. In the center was an open archway leading farther back into the rock. Not the rough natural rock of the caverns, though. The walls and floor of this passageway were smooth and finished. Interesting, Mara said, playing her glow rod around as they stood just outside the archway. Notice anything peculiar about the ceiling? It hasn't been smoothed down like the walls have, Luke said, eyeing the jutting rock hanging down from the arched ceiling. I wonder, Mara murmured. R2, your sensor's getting anything? R2 warbled a rather distressed-sounding negative, and Luke leaned over to check the datapad translation. He says the output from the power generator is masking pretty much everything else, he told Mara. That's probably where that hum is coming from, too. You think there's something else up there? Keeper of Promises said this area was lethal to Quam Jaw, Mara reminded him, and we all know how much the Quam Jaw like to hang from ceilings. And we had that cave of predators who eat flying things like Quam Jaw. Luke nodded, seeing where she was going with this. And a bunch of chiss up in the fortress who think of them as vermin. Not to mention that layers of cortosis ore back there, Mara said, which I still don't believe got there naturally. This place has defense rings six ways from Coruscant. As one would expect with Thrawn in charge of it, Luke said. Question is, do we try to do something about that ceiling, or assume it isn't something that will bother us? It's never a good idea to leave a danger at your back, Mira declared, taking a step just inside the archway. Here goes. Igniting her lightsaber, she hurled it expertly up to slice into the rocky ceiling. There was a brilliant flash, the crackle and stench of high-energy current, and suddenly the whole ceiling seemed to collapse. Mara was back out of the room in an instant, even as Luke ignited his lightsaber and jabbed it protectively over where her head had been. The ceiling fell onto it, draping itself over the green-white blade for a second before it was cut through and fell the rest of the way onto the floor. How cute, Mara said, peering in over his shoulder. It's like a sculpted conner net. A qualm jaw settles to a landing, there's a high-energy discharge that fries him, and the whole thing drops to take out any of his friends who happen to be with him. That's cute, all right, Luke murmured, poking at the netting with the tip of his lightsaber. Question is, is it safe now for us to walk over? Probably, Mara said. Connor nets are usually single-charge gadgets, and it doesn't do much good to leave it active once it's on the floor. Makes sense, Luke said, stretching out to the force as he eased his foot out over the net. No tingling of danger, and sure enough, his foot came down onto the net without even a spark of residual charge. It's clear, he said. Hold it, Mara hissed, taking a long step forward and putting her lightsaber handle across his chest to stop him, her sleeve blaster now gripped in her free hand. Something's coming. 
Luke stopped, listening to the soft clicking of feet on rock. More than one coming, too, by the sound of it. He played his glow rod down the tunnel, trying to see what was coming. And abruptly, from a group of narrow side openings he hadn't noticed, came a swarm of fist-sized insect-like creatures scuttling rapidly across the walls towards them. Watch it, Mara snapped, her blaster tracking. No, wait, Luke said, pushing her arm to the side off target. He'd caught a glint of metal. Just keep moving. R2, come on, hurry! He could sense Mara's strong disapproval, but she did as instructed without argument. The skittering creatures passed them by without slowing, apparently without even so much as a second glance. Luke reached to the end of the collapsed Connor net and stepped off onto the stone floor, and as Mara and R2 did likewise, he turned around to look. The creatures had grouped themselves around the front edge of the collapsed net. Even as Luke watched, they began to ease their careful way up the walls, carrying the edges of the net with them. Beside him, Mara snorted gently. Of course, she said, sounding mildly disgusted with herself. Maintenance droids, there to get the trap reset. Sorry, I guess I overreacted a bit. Considering it's Thrawn we're dealing with, overreaction isn't likely to be a problem very often, Luke said. Thanks, but you don't have to try to soothe my feelings, Mara told him, sliding the sleeve gun away and shifting her lightsaber to her right hand again. Lesson learned. Shall we go? What in the Empire are you talking about? Captain Nelgal demanded, blinking the sleep from his eyes as he grabbed for his uniform and started pulling it on. How can they be shooting at each other? The flashpoint is still three days away. I don't know, sir, the Tyrannic's duty officer said tautly. All I know is that the probe ships report the battle has begun, and that the section of planetary shield over the Bothan capital has collapsed. It's hard to tell from this distance, but they say the capital appears to be on fire in several places. Nalgul swore viciously under his breath. Someone had blundered, and blundered badly. Either the intelligence strike team, or Thrawn himself. It was a shocking thought. A shattering thought, even. If Thrawn's timing could be that far in error... He shook away his misgivings. What was done was done, and whatever mistakes or miscalculations had been made, he was determined that he and the Tyrannic wouldn't add to them. Have the obliterator in Iron Hand been informed, he asked, grunting out the last word as he leaned over to pull on his boots. Yes, sir. Probe ships report they're coming to full battle stations now. Make sure we get there ahead of them, Nalgal told him tartly. Yes, sir, the officer said again. Estimate we'll be at battle readiness in five minutes. Probe ships are continuing to feed us reports. Good, Nalgal muttered. Now that the shock of the news was fading, he realized it wasn't quite as bad as it first had seemed. All right, so the battle had started early. The three Star Destroyers were ready, or would be, before their presence was needed to eliminate the survivors of the battle raging out there. And blinded by the cloaking shield as they were, they definitely needed up-to-the-minute reports from the probe ships. The danger was that, with the ships dipping in and out of the shield with that kind of regularity, someone might notice something odd happening around the comet head and come over to investigate. But there was a way to minimize that risk. Put all tractor beam operators on full alert, he ordered. If any ship besides our own probe ships, and I mean any ship, pokes its nose inside the cloaking shield, I want it grabbed and held inside out of communication. Make sure that message gets to the other ships, too. No one is going to stumble in on us and live to talk about it. Understood? Understood, sir, the officer said. I'll be on the bridge in two minutes, Nalgo said, grabbing his tunic and belt. I want the ship at full battle readiness by the time I get there. We will be, sir. Nalgol slapped off the intercom and headed out the door of his quarters. Fine. So the aliens and alien lovers couldn't contain their self-destructive hatreds as long as Thrawn had expected. Fine. It just meant that the pent-up boredom and frustration of his crew would get released a little earlier. Smiling grimly, he headed down the corridor towards the turbo lift at a carefully measured walk. This was going to be a pleasure. A turbo laser flashed its lethal red beam sizzling perilously close to the Falcon's starboard side on its way towards an escort frigate with prosley markings. Han spun the ship away from a second shot, dodged the other direction barely in time to avoid a pair of Bagman custom ships, driving with laser cannon blazing towards the prosley. 
the whole universe had gone mad, with him square in the middle of it. What's happening over there? He called towards the calm, weaving between a pair of Oki's gunships. According to the Ashuri, three humans came aboard about half an hour ago, Leia's voice called back, the sound of an alert tone droning in the background. They had New Republic tech IDs and a letter from the Ashuri High Conflux authorizing them to examine the predominance's power couplings for oxidation damage. All phony, of course, Han growled, maneuvering the Falcon into a relatively clear space and looking around. It was like Endor all over again out there except that this time the Empire was nowhere to be seen. It was rebels fighting other rebels. We know that now, Leia agreed. Once aboard, they killed their escort and took over one of the turbo laser clusters. When the Drive Star and Shield went down, Han, they got eight shots off onto the surface before we were able to cut off power to their cluster. The Ashori still haven't been able to storm the room and get to them, even with Barkim and Saskamash helping them. Beside Han, Elagos murmured something in the Kamasi language. How bad did Drefstarn get hit? Han asked. Never mind. That's not important right now. What's happening with you and the ship? We're under attack, Leia said, her voice tense. Three Diamolan ships have joined up against us, one of them sitting between us and the planet in case we try to fire on Drefstarn again. No serious damage yet, I don't think, to either side, but that can't last. Didn't you tell them what happened? Han asked. I told them. The predominance's captain told them. Gavrasom told them, Leia said. They're not listening. Or else they don't care, Han said, clenching his teeth hard enough to hurt. Leia, trapped aboard a ship under massive attack. Look, I'm going to try to get over there, he told her. Maybe I can at least get you and Gavrasom off. No, stay away, Leia said sharply. Please, you'd never make it. Han gazed bitterly out at the swirling battle. She was right, of course. From his new vantage point, he could see the predominance now and the storm of turbolaser fire raking across it, and he knew full well the falcon shields wouldn't stand a chance in there. But he couldn't just sit out here and do nothing. Look, I've outfought star destroyers before, he said. You've outmaneuvered them, Leia corrected him. There's a big difference. Please, Han, don't try to... There was a squawk, and suddenly she was cut off. Leia! Han shouted, his chest tightening as he looked back at the Ashori war cruiser. It still seemed intact, but all it would take would be a single lucky shot into the bridge area. She's all right, Elago said, pointing at the comm display. They're just being jammed again. Han let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. We gotta do something, he said, searching the sky for inspiration. We've gotta get her off that ship. The comm crackled back to life. Leia? Han called, leaning hopefully towards the speaker. Solo? A male voice called. It's Carib Devist. Han grimaced. What do you want? We're kind of busy out here. No kidding, Carib snapped. And whose fault do you think that is? We already know, Han growled. Some troublemakers got aboard the predominance and started shooting. Probably Imperials. Definitely Imperials, Carib retorted and it was other Imperials who stirred the rest of the crowd into doing likewise. Or didn't you hear them broadcasting recorded attack orders in a half dozen different languages? Han threw a glower at Elagos, feeling a stab of chagrin at having totally missed reality on that one. So that was what those small Imperial ships Carib had identified had been hanging around Bothawui for. Obvious. Or at least it would have been obvious if anyone out there had bothered to take a minute to think it through. But nobody had. But that can wait, Carib went on. I called to warn you that I think there's something happening out by the head of that comet. Yeah? What sort of something? Han asked, his attention already back on the predominance and how in space he was going to get Leia off it. I don't know, Carib said. But there are a dozen mining ships fluttering around the area, all of them flying under Imperial pilots. Han frowned at the comm speaker. What are you talking about? What would Imperials want with ore buckets? I tell you, they're Imperial pilots, Carib insisted. Their whole flying style just screams it out. Okay, fine, Han said, not really interested in arguing the point. So what do you want me to do about it? There was a hiss of exhaled breath from the speaker. We're going to go check it out, he said, sounding disgusted. Under the circumstances, I thought you might be interested in taking a look yourself. Sorry to have bothered you. The calm clicked off. 
I'm sorry, too, Han muttered. He glanced at Eligos, paused for another look. What? he snarled. The Kamasi lifted his hands, palms up. I said nothing. What, you think I should just take off and head out there with him? Han demanded. Just leave Leia and go running off on a wild thresher hunt? Can you help her at the moment? Eligos countered mildly. Can you free her, or defeat the attacking ships, or halt the battle itself? That's not the point, Han bit out. Ten to one, they're just some miners who used to fly for the Empire. There are thousands of them around the New Republic. It doesn't mean a thing. Perhaps, Eligos said. You must balance that against all the rest. All the rest of what? The rest of all things, Eligos said. Your knowledge of Carib Devist and his observational abilities. Your belief, or lack of it, that he did not, in fact, betray you to the Empire while you were on Bastion. Your own experience with Imperial procedure and style, and whether you believe someone of Carib's skills could recognize them. Your trust in your wife and her reading of this man. He lifted his eyebrows slightly. And most of all, your innate sense of what is right and good. If there is indeed danger of some sort out there, whether you should leave him to face it alone. He isn't exactly alone, Han grumbled. He's got a whole bunch of his other clones with him. Elagos didn't reply. Han sighed and did a quick search of the sky. There was Carib's beat-up Action 2 freighter, all right, driving out past the boundaries of the battle towards the blazing comet in the distance. All alone. You know, you Kamasi could be a real pain if you worked on it a little, Han told Elagos, turning the Falcon to follow and keying the calm to Lando's comlink frequency. Lando? Hey, Lando, look alive! Yes, Han, what is it? Lando's tight voice came back. You back on the Lady Luck yet? I wish I were, the other said fervently. I'm stuck on the industrious thoughts with Senator Monotamia. Han grimaced. That's one of the ships attacking Leia? If Leia's on the predominance, yes, Lando said, his vo voice both disgusted and more than a little bit nervous. And we've got to get this thing stopped, and fast. No argument from me, buddy, Han said, steering clear of a pair of frothly patrol ships and slugging it out with a deterian starbark. Gaversom's with Leia. If you could get Myatamia to call off their jamming, maybe you can talk this thing down. I've already tried, Lando sighed. I'm the last person aboard anyone's interested in listening to. I know the feeling, Han said. Look, I need a quick favor. I'm heading over to that comet out there with Carib Devist. Put some macro binoculars on me, will you, just in case we run into trouble? There was a brief pause. Sure, no problem. Exactly what sort of trouble are you expecting? It's probably nothing, Han said. Carib seems to think there are Imperials out there flying ore buckets around. Just keep an eye on us, huh? I will, Lando promised. Good luck. Han keyed off the comm and swerved around the last handful of ships between him and the comet. Hang on, he told Elagos as he threw full power to the sublight drive. Here we go. Easy now, Bella Bliss warned from Booster's side. Take it nice and calm and easy. We're all friends here, with the protection of the outer defense perimeter between us and the nasty rebel attack force. We're safe now, and there's no need to look like we're hurrying. No, we wouldn't want to look like that, Booster growled, staring uneasily at the huge mass of the ubiquitous base looming directly ahead of them. Suddenly, his beloved errant venture didn't seem nearly so big and powerful and safe anymore as it used to. Steady, Tarek, Bella Bliss said. His voice, to Booster's thorough annoyance, was controlled and glacially calm. The big show's going on behind us, remember? The last thing we want to do is draw their eyes our direction. Booster nodded, glancing over at the aft display. There was a show going on back there, all right, with the New Republic ships taking a real beating from the Yaga Minor defense perimeter. Or at least, that was how it was supposed to look. If they were following orders, they were actually hanging just far enough back to keep from taking any really serious damage from the mass turbolaser fire. Hopefully, in all the confusion, the Imperials wouldn't notice that. I don't know, he said. I don't like this, Bella Bliss. We've got in too much, uh, we got in much too easy. 
General, we've got movement, the officer at the sensor station called. Imperial Star Destroyer moving up from starboard. Booster took a few steps forward along the command walkway, peering out the viewport, a bad feeling twisting into his gut. The Star Destroyer had appeared from around the starboard side of the base and had moved across the Aaron Ventures vector. And even as he watched, it stopped there, between them and the base, floating in space in front of them, as if daring them to pass. The ship IDs is the Relentless, someone else called. Captain Dorja listed as commander. Booster's bad feelings suddenly turned even worse. The Relentless. Wasn't that the ship that always showed up in the rumors about Grand Admiral Thrawn? Bella Bliss had come up on Booster's side again. General, Booster murmured. I know, Bella Bliss said, the calmness bending just a bit. But running now would only make us look guilty. All we can do is play it through. Transmission from the Relentless, General, the comm officer called. They're asking to speak to General or er, to Captain Nalgol. Booster looked at Bella Bliss. All we can do is play it through, Bella Bliss repeated. Go on, give it a try. Sure. Taking a deep breath, Booster caught the comm officer's eye and nodded. The man threw a switch and nodded back. This is Commander Ramus, temporarily in command of the Imperial Star Destroyer Tyrannic, he called in his best imitation of a typical Imperial's overly stiff speech pattern. Captain Nalgul was seriously injured in the last attack and is undergoing emergency treatment. There was a low chuckle from the bridge speakers. Really, the calm voice said. A steady voice. A cultured voice. A voice that scared Booster clear down to his boots. This is Grand Admiral Thrawn. You disappoint me, General Bella Bliss. Booster looked at Bella Bliss. The general was still staring out the viewport, his face not betraying any emotion at all. There's really no point in trying to maintain this charade, Thrawn said. But perhaps you need a more convincing demonstration. It was as if someone behind Booster had suddenly yanked a carpet out from under his feet. Suddenly he was toppling forward, arms flailing madly as he fought to regain his balance. Around him came the sounds of consternation from the rest of the bridge crew. From somewhere beyond that came the ominous sound of creaking metal. A small demonstration, as I said, Thrawn continued, his tone almost bantering. Your Star Destroyer is now totally helpless, pinned in place by approximately fifty of our heavy lift tractor beams. Booster swallowed a curse that wanted desperately to come out. What was it with this ship and tractor beams, anyway? He started as Bella Bliss tapped him on the arm. The general was glaring at him, gesturing him impatiently towards the comm station. Booster glared back, took a deep breath. Admiral Thrawn, sir, what are you doing? He called, trying to mix respect and bewildered fear into his tone. The latter part took no acting whatsoever. Sir, we have injured officers and crewers aboard. That's enough, Thrawn cut him off coldly. The attempt at casualness had apparently been too much for the red-eyed mongrel. It was back to being overbearing again. I respect your courage in making this attempt, but the game is over. Must I order the turbolaser batteries to commence taking the ship apart? Bella Bliss exhaled softly. No need for that, Admiral, he called. This is General Bella Bliss. Ah, General, Thrawn said. Once again, he'd changed tone, Booster noted, this time switching from cold threat to the almost cordial unspoken camaraderie between fellow professionals. The man was nothing if not versatile. I congratulate you, sir, on your attempt, futile though it may have been. Thank you, Admiral, Bella Bliss said. However, I suggest the success or failure of the operation is yet to be determined. Do you now, Thrawn said. Well, then, let us make it official. I hereby call on you to suspend your diversion and surrender your ship. Bella Bliss glanced at Booster. And if I refuse? As I suggested earlier, General, you're lying helpless before me, Thrawn said, his voice heavy with menace. At my order, your ship will be systematically destroyed. For a long moment, the bridge was silent. Booster watched Bella Bliss. Bella Bliss, in turn, was gazing out at the Star Destroyer standing in their path. 
I need to discuss this with my officers, he said at last. Of course, Thrawn said easily. Take your time. Only I suggest you don't take too much time. Your diversionary force is fighting valiantly, if ineffectually, but my patience towards them will not last forever. Interdictor cruisers are already moving into position to trap them there, and the various fighter commanders are pleading to be allowed to launch their ties and prey birds. Understood, Bella Bliss said. I'll deliver my answer as quickly as possible. He gestured to the comm officer to cut the transmission. What are you going to do now? Booster demanded. The thought of the errant venture ending up in, again in Imperial hands. As I promised, I'm going to deliver my answer, Bella Bliss said coolly. Tanneris, Bodway, where are those tractor beams originating? From the base or the defense perimeter? I'm getting 38 from emplacements in the perimeter, Bella Bliss's sensor officer reported. Fifteen more coming from the base itself, Bodway added. I have their locations marked. Thank you, Bella Bliss said. Simons, do we have any freedom of movement at all? Not really, sir, the helmsman said. We're pinned pretty solidly in place. What about rotational? Can we swivel around a vertical axis? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Actually, I think we can, the other said, frowning at his displays. Probably no more than a quarter turn, though. Not nearly enough to turn us around and get the blazes out of here, Booster muttered. Getting out isn't the goal, Bella Bliss reminded him. Simons, bring us around 90 degrees to port side, or as near to that as you can manage. Port side turbo lasers and proton torpedo tubes, prepare to fire at the defense perimeter at my command, targeting the tractor beam emplacements holding us here. Starboard weapons, same thing, only targeting the emplacements on the base. There was a chorus of acknowledgments. Booster gazed out at the base and the Star Destroyer standing ready in front of it. And as he watched, they started moving to the right. Slowly and ponderously, but moving. He took a step closer to Bella Bliss. You realize, of course, that you're not going to fool anybody with this, he warned. Least of all, someone like Thrawn. He's going to see us targeting the tractor beams and start slicing the ship up beneath us. Bella Bliss shook his head. I don't think so. Not yet, anyway. All the evidence indicates that he's trying to rebuild the Empire, and a mass of wreckage won't help him do that. What he really wants from us is a few high-ranking New Republic prisoners he can parade in front of potential converts to his cause. Not to mention picking up an extra Star Destroyer to use against anyone who isn't so easily converted? That too, Bella Bliss conceded. Bottom line, he's not going to start shooting until we're nearly free. Maybe not even then. Booster grimaced. No, Thrawn would be in no hurry. Not with the errant venture on the wrong side of all that firepower waiting at the perimeter. So how are you planning to get us out? Bill the Bliss shook his head. I'm not trying to get us out. I already told you that. We have a job to do, and that job is waiting for us in there. He nodded out the viewport at the ubiquitous base. With Thrawn and a Star Destroyer sitting between us and it? Booster snorted. Don't take this personally, General, and I'm sure you're a fine military mind and all that. But you try to slug it out with Thrawn, and we're all just roast dewback. I know, Bella Bliss said, his voice suddenly very deadly. That's why we're not going to engage him. At least, not the way he expects us to. Booster eyed him cautiously. There was something about the other's face and voice that was starting to send shivers through him. What are you talking about? We have to get past the relentless Terek, Bella Bliss said quietly, gazing out the viewport. And we have to disable it enough in the process that it won't be able to blast our slicers out of the sky before they can get to the computer extension and cut their way in. What about the base's own weapons? And we have to do it fast enough that the base's own weaponry won't have time to turn on us, Bella Bliss agreed. Add it all up, and there's only one way we can possibly pull it off. Still gazing out the viewport, he seemed to brace himself. As soon as we can break clear of the tractor beams, we're going to turn and drive as hard as we can straight for the Relentless. And we're going to ram it. Booster felt the air go out of him in a silent rush. You're not serious, he breathed. Bella Bliss turned, looking him straight in the eye. I'm sorry, Booster. Sorry about your ship. Sorry about letting you and your crew come aboard in the first place. General, the helmsman called. 
We've got a 79 degree displacement now. That's the best we're going to get. For another second, Bella Bliss held Booster's gaze. Then, turning his eyes away, he stepped past him. It will do, he said. All weapons, commence firing at tractor beam emplacements. Abruptly, out the viewport, a firestorm of turbolaser fire erupted, glancing outward from the angled hull in both directions. And helm and sublight engines, the general added calmly. Stand by for full emergency power. There he is, Eligo said, pointing. Over there, just to starboard. I see him, Han said. For a minute there, he'd lost Carib's freighter in the swirling glare of the comet's tail. You see any of the miners he was talking about? Not yet, Eligo said. Perhaps he was mistaken. Not likely, Han growled, the hairs on the back of his neck starting to tingle. He might not agree that Carib could pick out Imperials just by their flying style but he sure didn't doubt the guy could tell the difference between ore buckets and empty space. I wonder where they could have gotten to. Perhaps they're being masked by the tail, Eligo suggested. They may be working on the back quarter of the comet's surface. Miners never work back there, Han said, shaking his head. The dust and ice foul up alluvial dampers, something fierce. Then where are they? I don't know, Han said grimly, but I'm starting to get a very bad feeling about it. Keep me a transmission to Carib's freighter, will you? Eligos keyed the calm. Ready. Carib, Han called. You see anything? Nothing, the other's voice came back. But they were here, Solo. I believe you, Han said, throwing a quick look at the Falcon's weapons board. The quads were ready, keyed remotely down here to him. I think maybe it's time for a real close look at the surface. See what might be tucked away in there out of sight. Agreed, Carib said. You want us to lead the way down? That freighter of yours armed? There was just the briefest of hesitations. No, not really. Then I'd better take point, Han said, throwing more power to the sublight engines. Hang back and let me pass you. Whatever you say. Do you wish me to go to one of the weapons bays, Elagos asked quietly. Han threw him a quick glance. I thought Kamasi hated killing. We do, Eligo said soberly. But we also accept that there are times when killing a few is necessary for a greater good. This may well be one of those times. Maybe, Han grunted, easing his way back on the speed as the Falcon shot past the action, too. They were starting to get close into the comet now, and he didn't want to run into some loose piece of rock that might suddenly decide to break off into their path. No worry. Whatever they're hiding down there, I should be able to handle it okay by myself. It's not like you can cram a lot of firepower into one of those ore buckets. And right in the middle of his sentence, right before his eyes, the comet and the stars beyond it abruptly vanished. And in their place, its lights glowing evilly in the total blackness around it, was the dark shape of an Imperial Star Destroyer. Han! Eligos gasped. What? Cloaked Star Destroyer! Han snapped back twisting the helm yoke viciously, the whole plan suddenly coming clear. That battle back there over Bathawui, all those ships beating each other into rubble, with a Star Destroyer waiting hidden here, ready to finish them all off and maybe burn Bathawui in the bargain. No survivors, no witnesses, only a battle everyone in the New Republic would blame everyone else for. And the civil war that single battle would spark might never end. Get ready on the comm, he told Elagos as the Falcons veered hard around back towards the invisible edge of the cloaking shield. The second we're clear, the order choked off as he was abruptly thrown hard against his restraints. Beneath him, the Falcon jerked to the side like a wounded animal, the roar of the sublight engines mixing with the creaking of stressed joints and supports. What is it? Elagos gasped. Han swallowed hard, his hands tightening uselessly on the yoke. It's a tractor beam, he told the Kamasi, throwing a desperate glance at the sensor display. If it was an edgewise grab, something marginal or tenuous, he might be able to wiggle his way out. But no, they had him. They had him solid. He looked up again as a motion caught his eye. Carib's freighter, now inside the cloaking shield with him, twisting helplessly in the same invisible grip. They've got us, Elagos, he sighed, the bitter taste of defeat in his mouth. They've got us both. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it.
talk to you soon.